If there is one area in our lives as followers of Jesus that so many of us struggle with, it's what? It's our prayer life, isn't it? Do a survey among any group of followers of Jesus and ask them this, are you satisfied with your prayer life? The answer that the vast majority of us will give is not really. Yes, 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 we all pray. Some of us use an app to help, some of us journal, some of us, you know, just toss up a quickie when things are not going well or where, when we're looking for that, you know, elusive parking spot. Some of us, we have the shopping list, don't we? You know, the same list of the same things that, that we ask God for day in and day out. And if we're honest, I have a sneaking suspicion that we might be just a little bored and, and wonder if God might be too. And then something happens. Then we meet someone who's different, whose prayer life isn't the same struggle, who, who enjoys prayer, who actually delights in speaking with God, who, who doesn't just have that shopping list, who, who seems to know what to ask for, who's not like the rest of us. Their prayer life, it seems to be powered by an extraordinary fuel. Have you met people like that? Have you felt yourself asking, what do they know? What do they know that, that I don't? What is the fuel that powers their prayer life? Today, as we continue our extraordinary series, we're going to continue dipping into Paul's letter to his friends in the Turkish city of Ephesus. And as we look at it, we're going to look at the way that Paul prays for his friends. It's quite a revelation because he has just one request. Just one, but I have a sneaking suspicion that once, once you and I understand the reason for his one request, and, and that once we see the results that will flow from that one request, I have a sneaking suspicion that your prayer life and mine might look more than a little different. So how about we pray? and ask God to speak to us through his word. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, please speak to us. Please speak to us and teach us how we can speak to you, because this is what we long to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll get into Paul's prayer and his one request in just a moment. But the first thing we need to do is we need to do what Paul does in Ephesians 1, which is have a good look around and see what Paul sees, because what he sees quite simply blows him away. Paul sees two things. The first is what we saw last week with Ray. We saw that God's first instinct is to show mercy with an extravagant love that he's lavished upon us. We saw that those of us who are followers of Jesus, that, that we're chosen by God, that we're his children, that we're fully forgiven and completely redeemed. And we saw that God's spirit, we saw that the spirit is dwelling within us and the spirit, he's, he's, he's the seal, the mark of ownership that we really are God's own. And we saw that every detail of our salvation is the result of God's sovereign grace. And then standing above it all, we saw that the reason, the reason for all of this is for the praise of God's glorious grace. Now, the second thing that Paul sees when he takes a good look around is the Ephesians themselves. He sees this extraordinary God and what that God has done in them. Look what he says in verse 15. He says, for this reason, that is because of everything I've been raving about and because I've heard of two things about you, two things that prove that God is at work in you. You see, I've heard of your faith. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, that that is something that's only possible if God had adopted you and, and lovingly chosen you. And I've heard, I've heard of your love toward all the saints, not, not just some of the fellow believers, but your love for all of them, that is, those who are like you, as well as those who aren't. In other words, those who are from your tribe, your background, your ethnic group, 
as well as those who are really different from you. When I see that, I see something that is only possible if the Ephesians had grasped the grace that God had lavished on them. His mercy and redemption and forgiveness and love makes such a difference. When they didn't deserve it, it changes them. It's the same thing that Paul would see if he was to look around fellowship. He'd see the same two pieces of evidence of, of God's work in us and among us. He'd see the miracle, the miracle of men, women and children all placing their faith in Jesus. And he'd see this marvellous mix of the nations coming together and loving each other richly. Think about it. Where else under the sun do you see a group of people all turning themselves a bit inside out as we try and learn how to love others who are so different from us? You know, different. We speak different languages. We have different passports. We come from different cultures. We have different customs and different skins. All the things that usually, that, that usually divide people. But here at Fellowship, what do we see? We see love toward all the saints. I'm blown away by the love that you guys show me as, as you put up with my clunky Australianness, as you put up with my bluntness and my pastoral faux pas and my awful accent. Thank you. I'm blown away by our 242 group leaders and what they do. Every Saturday morning at nine o'clock, there's a bunch of them who they get out of bed on their off day to join a Zoom call with me and they spend two hours being trained. Why do they do it? They do it because they love their 242 group members and they want to see them grow. So they love their members by sacrificing themselves. I'm blown away by our welcome team. Every Sunday, they get to church an hour before the service to pray for us and to plan how they're going to love us. They serve us not just before the service, but, but during it, and then they stay long after we've gone. They don't come to be served, but to serve. Why do they do it? Because they love all of the saints, because God is at work in them. Paul looked around, and that's what he saw. God at work in the Ephesians. And so he writes, verse 16, I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I'm always thankful to God for what I see God doing in you and through you. And that thankfulness, you know, it moves quickly into the request. The request that the God of verses 3 to 14, who, was, who has done so much for the Ephesians already, whose, if you like, whose fingerprints are all over their lives, he asks that God would do one thing. Verse 17, I keep remembering you in my prayers asking, and here's the one thing, asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may do what? May give you what? The spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Which, at first glance, is a very strange request. After all, verse 13 reminds us that, that the Ephesians were already sealed with the Holy Spirit as the guarantee of their inheritance. So what is this spirit of wisdom and of revelation? Is it a second spirit? Is it a different spiritual blessing? Well, I don't think it can be that because verse 3 tells them that they've received every spiritual blessing already. So what is it? The key is the context. It's always the context. The key is what Paul says next because the next phrase helps explain the request. Paul's asking the Father of glory to give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And then he says, verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now, it's a little hard to see in English, but this is actually a statement about what has happened to them in the past. It could just as easily have read, having had the eyes of your hearts enlightened. 
In other words, since you can see, since you can see things as they are, since you can see all that God has done for you, since you can see his, his grace and mercy and love and your inheritance and God's plan in Christ and all that's in verses 3 to 14, since you can see all that, I'm asking God that he would do something else. I'm asking God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation for a reason. Why? So that you may know something. So that you can know something else. So that you can know actually three something else's. We'll get to those in a moment. I have a sneaking suspicion that those folk that you and I know whose prayer lives are the ones that we envy, I have a sneaking suspicion that they know these three somethings and that they shape their prayers. Can you see with me that this isn't a request for a new spirit? It's simply Paul's way of asking God to be at work in the Ephesians through the Holy Spirit who they already have. It's simply Paul asking God to give them more of what the Holy Spirit has already done for them and in them so that they can have you know, a deeper, fuller, richer, that knowledge, understanding, perception, grasp, appreciation of, of God's plans and purposes for the whole of creation, for the whole of time, and also grasp their small part in that. Let's have a look at what Paul is asking the spirit of wisdom and revelation would help the Ephesians to know. The three things are simple. Firstly, the hope of his calling. Secondly, his glorious inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, his power towards us who believe. I reckon that's worth asking God for. I reckon asking for those three things is a good thing. It's not shopping list praying. It's actually kind of exciting. What I want to do, and I reckon the best way forward, is to think about what it would mean if the Ephesians actually grow in knowledge in these three areas. And, and to do that, we should ask this question. What ought we to expect to happen if God answers Paul's prayer? What results should we expect to see? And if you and I pray, as Paul does, what will happen if God, through his spirit, helps us to know more and more deeply the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? What will that look like? Let's have a look at the results one at a time. Let's start with the hope of his calling. Now, in the New Testament, his calling, God's calling, is God's calling of us into relationship with him and all of the blessings that flow from that. His call is always to faith in Jesus or the fruit of that faith. That is, it's to a life of holiness. That is, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, actually spell out our calling. We're called to be holy and blameless before him. We've been adopted as his sons and daughters. Thirdly, we've, we've been redeemed through his blood. Fourthly, we've been forgiven. Fifthly, we've been united with Christ. And sixthly, we have an inheritance guaranteed by the Spirit. That's quite a list. Let's take them one at a time. Let's firstly look at what it will mean to have a deeper, fuller, richer knowledge and understanding that we really are absolutely holy and blameless before him. I think it's actually quite marvellous. The result is that we will grow more and more secure that we really are just that, holy and blameless before God our Father. Not, not because of our own good deeds. No, 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 we're sinful. But because before the creation of the world, our Father chose us to be just that, holy and blameless, and he made it possible. And so when we sin, and we will every single day until Jesus returns, so when we sin, we won't despair. We, we won't beat ourselves up. Rather, we'll rest. 
will rest in what he's done in Christ for us, secure that it's all his work that makes us holy and blameless, not ours. We'll stop beating ourselves up for our failures. We'll allow him to take the pressure of us to perform. And secondly, growing in our knowledge that we're actually God's children, that we've been adopted. That will allow us to do what I've been doing with my two grandchildren over the last four weeks. It's been a delight. It's allowed my grandchildren and me just to snuggle in tight. It, it, it'll allow us when life is tough, when we're hurt and battered, when, when we just need to be comforted, it'll allow us to come and find solace in our heavenly father like my grandchildren did with me. As the spirit does his work, we'll grow in our knowledge of our hope that we really have been adopted into God's family, that the relationship is real. We'll come to our father knowing, knowing that he will never turn us away, that his arms are always open, that his heart is always overflowing with grace and love. We'll come and we'll ask. We'll come and he'll hold us. We'll come and he'll care for us. We'll come and, and the Spirit will write deep into our hearts that certainty that we will never, ever be turned away. Now, I think that's worth asking God for. That's worth praying for, isn't it? And, and growing in our knowledge of our redemption through his blood, thirdly, oh my goodness gracious me, the Spirit, he will help us to know, to know the cost of our redemption. Yes, our redemption is absolutely free for us. But our redemption, the price paid for our sin, it cost Jesus his life. And the Spirit, as he, as he helps us to know our hope, he'll teach us again deep in here at the core of our souls. He'll teach us that Jesus loved us so much. He didn't hesitate to pay. He never balked at the cost. He willingly gave his life for ours. The Spirit will write that love for us in here. And that love, when we understand it deeply, it profoundly changes everything. It colours everything we do, everything we say, everything we long for. I think that's worth asking God for, isn't it? That's worth putting on our prayer list. Fourthly, growing in our knowledge of the hope of our forgiveness. Again, what will that look like? Let me ask you this. Do you have trouble forgiving yourself? Do you look at what you've done, you know, the hurt that you've caused others, the, the damage you've done to yourself, and do you find yourself not being able to let go of it? Do you find yourself punishing yourself for what you've done? Do you find yourself reliving what you've done paralysed by your past? Do you find yourself verbally abusing yourself quietly in the recesses of your own heart? Do you tell yourself that you're just not worthy? Do you give up trying to make things better because you don't think you deserve it? Let me assure you of this. If any of that is you, as the Spirit, as he enables you to know the hope of your calling to forgiveness, He'll write the absolute certainty of Jesus' death for you, for you personally, for you specifically, for all your sin in all of its hideousness. He'll write that in his blood on your heart. The Spirit of God himself, he will enable you to know, deeply know, that your Father has put your sin as far from him as the East is from the West. That The Spirit of God will take those words, I love you, and stop them being just words and write them deep, deep, deep into the core of our beings so that his forgiveness, it, it begins to drip from every pore of our body, overwhelming us with thankfulness and joy. That's worth asking God for. That's worth praying for, isn't it? What about fifthly, growing in our knowledge of the hope of being united with Christ? For some of us, relationships have always been tough. No one's ever really been there for us. Our parents, enough said. Our friends, 
Well, it's one letdown after another. Our romantic relationships, our hearts told us that we were in it for life, but it hasn't worked out. They always seem to walk away. So, so when it comes to God, for some of us, there is that nagging fear that he'll walk too. But our hope, our certainty, is that before the creation of the world, before we'd done anything good or bad, our Father had chosen us to be united with him in Christ. He decided it was going to be that way. He did everything to make it possible. He paid the price. He made forgiveness possible. And that means he won't ever let us mess it up. When the Spirit enables us to know our hope that we are united with Christ, he teaches us that we will never, ever, ever be separated from him. Our sin, your sin, my sin can't break that bond. Remember, Jesus died for us when we were his enemies. If he did that then, the Spirit will certainly teach us to trust him now. So that when he says, no one can rip you out of my arms, we'll know deep in here that he means it. And we'll learn to rest in that certainty and have that certainty shape everything about who we are. That's worth asking God for. That's worth praying for, isn't it? What about sixthly? Growing in our knowledge of the hope of our inheritance. As good as all we have already in Christ is, there's actually more coming. Our inheritance is coming. That is, on that day when our Heavenly Father, he, when he wipes away every tear, when there'll be no more mourning or crying or pain, when there will be, well, when we'll be with him forever, without any hint of our sin, when the Spirit helps us to long for that day, when we reach our inheritance, what he does is he enables us to see this life for what it is. He changes us so that we don't invest here in this life as if it was all that there is, as if what happens here is the ultimate. He enables us to invest in what's going to outlast the judgment day. He helps us to see that, you know, the houses, the cars, the clothing, the travel, the reputation, the career, the, the projects, they... They're also very temporary and so very short-lived in comparison to what's coming on the last day. That, that understanding, that wisdom, that insight from the Spirit will shape just about every decision we make every day. And again, that's worth asking God for. That's worth praying for, isn't it? Let's now think about what it will look like if he helps us to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Well, the first thing to notice is that that is, the, the, that that is his inheritance, not ours. And if we're going to grow in our knowledge of his inheritance, we firstly need to work out what his inheritance actually is. Now, for those of us who are familiar with the way that God talks about his people in the Old Testament, the identity of his inheritance is easy. Because over and over again, God calls his people his inheritance or my inheritance. So when Paul prays that the Ephesians would know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, he's simply asking God through the Spirit to show the Ephesians just how glorious they are and what that means. That is, He's asking God to help the Ephesians know that God's people, they're made up of Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, black, white and brown, young and old, rich and poor, from every nation under the sun, that we are together God's glorious inheritance, that we are his own possession, that we are those who he will use if you like, to display his glory to the whole of the universe, to show the untold riches of his glory to anyone who dares to look. That is, when people look at us, 
And when they remember that we used to be objects of God's wrath, dead in our sins, slaves to our passions and pleasures, and when the whole company of heaven looks at what we were and then sees what God has done for us, raising us to life and seating us in the heavenly realms with Christ at God's right hand, taking us from the lowest of the low and seating us with him in the highest of the high, when they see that it's all because of God's love and mercy, then the whole of creation is going to marvel and wonder and delight in God's glorious grace. Creation will look at us, God's glorious inheritance in the saints, and the, the whole of creation will glorify him for all that he's done in us. And when the Spirit helps us to know this, that we are his saved people, are his glorious inheritance, it profoundly affects how we live because what we'll long to do is show off his glory to the world. For the past four weeks, our grandchildren, as I said, have been staying with us. This is Aria. She's about to turn four. Aria has a toy. It's a much beloved stuffed rabbit called Zazi. Bedtime is just not possible without Zazi. But last week, there was a problem with Zazi. His feet were all falling to pieces and the stuffing was leaking out and Aria was very sad. So my wife, the very clever Caroline, who our grandchildren call Lolly, what did Lolly do? Well, she found some fabric that matched the fabric of Zazi's feet perfectly. And then she proceeded to fix them so that they looked even better than when they were new. And when I got home from work that day, what did Aria do? She ran to the front door and said to me with Zazi in her hand, look what Lolly did. And she proceeded to show me Zazi's new feet. That is, Aria glorified her Lolly. She glorified Kaz. When the Spirit helps us to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, like Aria, we'll long to glorify the one who has done all of this for us. We'll long to show God's glory to the world. And we'll do that as we love one another as lavishly as we've been loved, as we choose to love those the world you know, simply discards, as we show grace to those who, like us, who simply don't deserve grace, as we forgive as we've been forgiven, as we, as we revel in our new life in Christ. That's worth asking God for. That's worth praying for, isn't it? So finally, what will happen if, as Paul prays, God through his spirit helps us know more and more deeply the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? What will that look like? Well, the first thing to notice about this part of Paul's prayer is that Paul doesn't ask God to give us that power for ourselves. He doesn't ask God to help us to wield that power or to use it or to have it in our own lives so that we can, you know, wield it. Rather, he asks God through the Spirit to enable us to know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. That is, know the power that God has used in us and the power that God has used for us. That is, Paul wants God to help us to understand the experience that we've had of God's power at work in our lives. And in verses 20 to 23, he gives us an outline of what that power is actually like. It's the power, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That same power we'll see next week in chapter 2, that same power raised us from the dead too. For you and I, we were dead in our sins, completely unable to save ourselves. But now, because of God's power in us, we're alive with Christ. It's the power that saw Jesus seated at the right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the age to come. 
It's the same power that we'll see next week in chapter 2, verse 6. It's the same power that raised you and I up with him and seated us there with him in the heavenly places now. Seated us where Jesus rules. You may be sitting at home, but you're also sitting in heaven. So what will it look like in our lives if we know this power? It'll see us recognising the impact of this power in our lives. We'll look back at what we were like before God raised us up with Christ. And we'll see the changes that he's made possible because his power is at work in us. And as we look at that power in us, we're going to long for others to know that same power in their lives too. So we'll speak to others of the power of God in our lives and we'll tell them of the way that God has used his power to transform us, to change our lives. And we'll let them know that God can change their lives too, that God longs for his power to transform them as he has with us. And we'll pray for our not yet Christian friends and family. We'll ask God to use his power to raise them from the dead, asking him to use his power in their life as he has in ours. And as we grow to know this power more and more, we'll recognise that we can't raise anyone from spiritual death to life. It's God's power that raises the dead. It's God's power that brings life. All we can do is ask him. Ask him to be powerful at work in the lives of those we know and love. Which means, you know, friends, we won't get frustrated when those around us don't get Jesus or can't see their sin or, or give us a hard time for our faith in Jesus. We won't get frustrated. We won't because we'll recognise that God's power towards us means that we understand. We'll see that it's only because he's worked in us that we get it, that we can trust Jesus, that our lives are being and continue to be transformed. And so we'll ask him to be powerfully at work in those around about us, changing them as he's changed us. We won't be proud. We won't look down on others. We won't think we're better. On the contrary, we'll simply grow in humility constantly aware that it's God's power alone that has seen us rise from the death, rise from ignorance to understanding to the brilliance of Jesus' death for us. We get it because of him. Now, I keep saying that's worth asking God for, that's worth praying for, because it is. But how can we do this? I want to suggest to you, it's, it's not rocket science. Prayer is just speaking to God. So if you're a prayer list person, why don't you add Ephesians 1, 15 to 20 to your list? If that's not you, why not decide for this week that you'll pull Ephesians 1, 15 to 20 out every day and simply read it. Remember some of the things that we've heard today and then pray through it. I've asked Barak if, if he'd come and show us how we can use Ephesians 1 to shape our prayers. Thanks, Barak. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the faith we have found in him and I pray that you would grow our faith in him. Please grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and a deep and intimate knowledge of you, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we will be able to know and understand the hope to which you have called us to and understand the richness of your glorious inheritance in us. I pray that you will enable us to know and understand how impossible it is to measure the unlimited greatness of your power in and for us as we believe. Enable us to rejoice in the riches of your eternal inheritance, which is us in you. Help us know the resurrection power that is at work in us and was demonstrated in the working of your mighty strength through Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power and dominion and every name in this age and the one to come for your glory and our joy in Jesus' name. Amen.